Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Monday, February 20th. This is Africa 54. The 36th ordinary session of the African Union Assembly wraps up in Ethiopia with Comorian President Azali Asumani taking over the rotating chairmanship of the continental body. A military procession and mourners will come home the body of Ghanaian soccer player Christian Achu, who died in the devastating Turkey earthquake. This and much more on today's Africa 54. And at the AU summit, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed specifically spoke about the need for Africa to feed itself. Let's take a listen. It's not only well able to feed itself, but can become a breadbasket of the world. With 65% of the world's remaining uncultivated arable land in our backyard, we need to critically assess why one third of the hungry people in the world are in our continent. All right, Bagasi, I guess we have. For more insight on the just concluded African Union Summit, I'm joined live via Skype by Kwaku Nuama, Professor of Politics at American University in Washington. Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Esther. I cannot see you, but I hope you're there. Let's go on with this. The African Union Summit, of course, wrapped up on Saturday. Uh, the incoming AU Chairman, Professor Kwaku Azalia Sumani of uh, Comoros, is proposing the speeding up of the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. How would the speeding up that uh, translate into benefits for the continent? Well, this is Im important. Um, the currently, Trade on the continent, um, it's about 15%, um, and they're trying to push it up to about 60% by 2034. Unfortunately, uh, COVID got in the way of the implementation of uh, the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, and also we see disagreements over tariff reduction and border closures. And so this is something that they're going to have to work uh, hard on. Uh, he's going to have to work with uh, Wamkele Mene, uh, the Secretary General of, the, of, of ACFA, to make sure that each country is willing to make the sacrifices that is needed to make uh, this important institution work. Uh, Professor, uh, an unusual move happened this weekend where we have three African countries that were not invited to the African Union Summit. Talk about them and the reasons behind uh, this move. Well, these are the countries that are being punished for violating the anti-coup norm. So it's Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. Um, and they've been excluded. Um, I, think it's a, I think you have to let them in. You cannot shave a man's head in his absence. And if Africa really cares about uh, promoting democracy, then we have to take a bigger look at all the countries that are violating uh, democracy norms, not just the ones people there at the summit who shouldn't be there. If the African Union really cares about uh, promoting democracy. There are countries that violate human rights. There are countries that rigged elections. There are countries that uh, extend constitutional mandates uh, illegally. And they are all there. So the, the coup makers, um, yes, they are in the, in, uh, currently on the house seat. Uh, but you got to talk to them. Because if without talking to them, you're not going to be able to do the reforms that you need to do. But uh, I, I wish we cast the, way, uh, the net a little wider to uh, address other issues uh, that, undermine, that undermine democracy on the continent. Well, there are other issues, Professor. The issue of food insecurity in Africa, the issue of uh, security uh, in areas like the Sahel region, the DRC, uh, the M23 rebels and all those groups operating there were also mentioned. But the question is, mentioning them, but is there any goodwill and finances to take very swift action to make sure that Africa is food secure and deal with all these insecurity issues we're talking about here? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Um, are we just talking about these things? So are we really doing the things that are important and necessary to get uh, food security 
address. Uh, part of the food security problem is uh, climate. Uh, we see drought in East Africa and, and the Horn, uh, but also part of it is uh, uh, the effect of Russia's uh, war um, um, on Ukraine. And African, African countries have to decide uh, what they're going to do about these things. But at, at, the, at a very basic level, countries have to invest in the institutions, uh, in markets, in agricultural research, and have to take food security uh, seriously. We, we are, it's, uh, it's embarrassing that we cannot feed ourselves and are always at, 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 the, at, the, at, at the receiving end of these kinds of global shocks. So um, I saw the Ethiopian Prime Minister's speech, and it's a, it's, it's a good one. I think Africans have to be able to feed ourselves uh, to be taken seriously. Otherwise, in the time there's a, a, a small problem in the world, it affects us. Uh, with, with regards to the other issues, I think uh, the security uh, issues are important. The uh, problems in the DRC, problems in the Sahel, but also Ethiopia itself. Ethiopia is hosting this summit. It, it has enormous security challenges, and I hope that they can talk about it. The problem is that a lot of these talks are just too, uh, people are just too nice, and uh, they don't really address their issues, and everybody's being collegial, and they won't call out the people who are undermining uh, security in these places. For example, you cannot address problems in the DRC without actually uh, confronting Pokagami and some of the leaders that are important in determining security in that area. But the AU is not set up to do those kinds of things. And they just uh, talk about, uh, you know, brotherliness and let's all have peace and let's all be nice. And those things do not right, bring peace. Professor. You have to address the right. forces. Professor, we'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Esther. Professor Kwakunuwama is uh, at the International Politics uh, is a professor of international politics, rather, at American University here in Washington. Now, the body of Ghanaian soccer player Christian Achu was welcomed in across Sunday evening by a military procession and a crowd of mourners. Here's David Doyle with more. The body of Ghanaian soccer player Christian Atsu was flown home to Accra on Sunday evening. <laughs> The day after he was found dead under a collapsed building in southern Turkey after a devastating earthquake. His coffin, draped in Ghana's national flag, was received by a large military procession and a crowd of mourners, as well as Vice President Mohamedou Baramir. We hope against hope. Every day that passed, we prayed and prayed. But alas, when he was found, he was no more. Atsu had been missing since the February 6th earthquake, which collapsed an apartment building where he'd been living in Hatay. He had been scheduled to fly out of Turkey hours before the quake, unhappy with the amount of playing time he was getting at his club, Hatay Spor. But his manager said on Friday that he had opted to stay after scoring the winning goal in a match on February the 5th. Atsu won 65 caps for Ghana and had helped them to reach the final of the 2015 Africa Cup of Nations. The 31-year-old winger was among more than 46,000 people killed in southern Turkey and northwest Syria. That was David Doe of Reuters reporting. France and Burkina Faso officially marked the end of French military operations in the West African nation. The Bukinabe Armed Forces made the announcement on Sunday following a flag-lowering ceremony at the French Special Forces camp on Saturday. In January, Burkina Faso gave France one month to withdraw its troops as it ended a military accord that allowed French troops to fight insurgents on its territory, citing a wish for the country to defend itself. Their departure marks a new chapter in Burkina's battle with the Islamist groups linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, which have taken over large areas of land and displaced millions of people in the wider Sahel region. We really believe that in a few years, we won't even be talking of these bandits that are walking around on our territory. We are confident and we are watching closely so that some locals and the French military that is being chased out do not work together to destabilize our fight against terrorism. We are here to show our patriotism, to show our support to the transition, to show our support to the army, to show our support to Captain Ibrahim Traoré, to say no to French imperialism, to say no to the French army. We don't want them to stay one more minute here. 
they need to leave our Burkina Faso. We don't want them on our territory because when they are here and our people die, they do nothing. If they stay beyond the exit date, authorities should expect us in their base because we are going to go there. The departure of uh, some 400 French special forces from Burkina follows a sharp deterioration in relations that included Ouagadougou asking France to recall its ambassador. For more insight on the French troops' exit from Burkina Faso, I'm joined by Bagasi Kura, VOS Bambara Chief. Bagasi, welcome again to Africa 54. Hi, good evening. So now, Bagasi, the big question is the French troops are out of Burkina Faso. Is the military in Burkina Faso capable of dealing with the insurgency, the Islamic State and the Al-Qaeda chaos that have been very, very uh, frequent in yeah. the country? That's something we will have to see as of now. It, this is not the case. For the last two weeks, there have been 100 people killed. All part of the country is uh, occupied by militant group, including uh, entire provinces. And we have uh, more than 40% of the country occupied by militant group. So clearly, up to today, the military is not able to do the job. And they have been going two coup d'etat. What that means is that we have a military very, very divided because those who have been overthrown uh, are not willing to join the new leaders. So you have infighting within the military. That will need to be fixed before we can see some r real result on the ground. You paint a very grim picture of what might happen in Burkina Faso, but what gains did the French troops uh, leave in Burkina Faso? I think there has been a, a big confusion about the French. What French did in Mali, or the status in Mali, was very different from the one in Burkina Faso. They came in Burkina Faso around 2009, 2010, not because of Burkina Faso. They were looking for just a place well located to intervene in the rest of Sahel, Chad, Mauritania, Mali, Niger. Not, Burkina was not part of that deal. So they sat in Burkina, and usually airlift themselves to other countries. It's only in 2015, when the judges arrived in Burkina, that authorities asked them, so you guys are nearby, but you always go outside to intervene. How about us? Maybe you can also help us. So they made this accord in 2015, and then in 2018, the accord says French can only intervene in Burkina only if they get asked by the authorities. So more and more for the last two years, they have not been asked to intervene. So it's hard to blame them for the situation while people have not been asking them to, to help. And, and very briefly, uh, Bagasi, is this likely to happen from what you're learning from analysts in other countries where French yes, troops that's are going to be because kicked out? Because I believe the French are misreading the African sentiment. People really seemed fed up. It didn't start with jihadist movement today. We remember a decade ago in Ivory Coast in 2004, people were out on the street asking the French to leave. It happened in Central African Republic more than eight years ago where people felt like the French were helping the rebels. And it will happen again and again and uh, I don't know if going to Niger or Ivory Coast or Chad will fix the problem. They will, you know, they will face the same sentiment. People feel like the army need to stand up and do the work for them. Bagasi, thank you very much for your insight. Thank you. Bagasi Kura is VOS Bambara chief. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs on our website at voaafrica.com. Still to come, Nigerians are expressing optimism that Saturday's presidential election will be peaceful, transparent, and credible. We'll hear from voters. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see. We seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, 
Our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. In other news, Mauritius Meteorological Services on Monday issued a Class 3 cyclone warning after informing citizens that Cyclone Freddy is moving west-southwest toward the island nation at an increased speed of approximately 30 kilometers per hour. Authorities are cancelling all flights and halting public transportation. Lieutenant General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, Chief of Sudan's Rapid Support Forces, a paramilitary group accused of widespread human rights abuses, is defending the RSF's legitimacy, saying he is committed to integrating the force into a reformed national armed forces. And in the U.S., the Carter Center has announced that former President Jimmy Carter, 98, has entered home hospice care. The charity created by the former president posted on Twitter that after a series of short hospital stays, President Carter has decided to spend his remaining time at home with his family instead of additional medical intervention. Nigerians are expressing optimism that Saturday's presidential election will be peaceful, transparent and credible. Key among many concerns of Nigerians are the shortages of fuel and of newly released currency. Analysts say voter apathy that characterizes Nigeria's election appears to be waning in this vote. They also say social media platforms where many youth express themselves appear to have played a key role in encouraging them to participate in the elections. Viewers Peter Claudi in Abuja to cover this election for us and he spoke to citizens ahead of the elections. And my message to the people, even beginning with myself, is that we we'll go out and vote in a mass without fear. No intimidation. Anybody who harasses you, stand your ground. Cast your vote and even stand by calmly, not with trouble, not uh, trying to create a problem. And listen to what will be, whatever will be the outcome of the result. You have to stand by. If you go home, you may not know what to be done. They may manipulate, but God will disappoint the manipulators. Okay, I'm expecting a free and fair election. I'm expecting a peaceful election and I'm also expecting everybody to come out to vote and to do it peacefully. Has the Electoral Commission given you confidence that the elections will be free, fair, transparent and credible and smooth? Well, I believe they are doing their best to give us uh, a free and fair election. And until we, they have been given a chance to actually do that, then we cannot be able to, we can't judge them on what, either they do it right or they do it, or it's not good enough. It's until they have done it, then we say, okay, you should have done better. I think, I just believe they're doing their best. My fellow Nigerians, I advise that we all come out and mass and make that, that great decision that will make Nigeria great again. That will change Nigeria for the better and make us come out of the mess. This APC, this APC government has, has put us through. As the presidential candidates head into the home stretch and make a final push for votes in the February 25th election, Nigeria is battling unprecedented unemployment of 33% and growing insecurity. More than 80 million Nigerians, 40% of the population, are living in poverty, according to government data. 
For more on the upcoming election, let's go live to VOS Peter Claude, who is standing by in Abuja. Hello, Peter. Hello, Esther. How are you? I was hoping to see you, but as campaigns wrap up in Abuja, what is happening? What's the latest uh, from your standpoint? Well, the situation is pretty interesting. Uh, people are really excited about the upcoming election, which the much anticipated one is the presidential election. But don't forget, we also have um, the senatorial election and the House of Representatives elections. But most people are focusing on the much anticipated presidential election. We have 18 presidential candidates who are each saying that they are going to win. But from the people that I have spoken with, uh, they have their choices. They, th they think one of the top four will be the next president to replace uh, outgoing President Mohamed Buhari. Peter, let's go to the top two, maybe. Let me know, what are they telling the voters they are likely to change from what uh, President Mohamed Buhari was able to do in the last two terms that he has served as president? Interestingly, the two top candidates are saying they want a new Nigeria. They pretty much are saying the same thing about addressing insecurity challenges. They are also talking about improving the living, uh, uh, the living conditions of Nigerians. Uh, some of them say they will uh, reverse the new currency policy instituted uh, by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Of course, it has to be signed off by President Mohamed Buhari. Some of uh, the ruling party uh, stalwarts or founders of the party have been critical. Uh, they said the policy is night, but implementation appears to be woefully challenging. And they think that it will go in favor of the main opposition parties ahead of the election. So these are some of the things that are going on at the moment. Some people are saying that because of the lack of funds in the system, uh, they, are, they can't buy and sell, uh, even the cashless transactions on uh, mobile phones have been a bit challenging and people are being critical about it. But it, it, it remains to be seen how the elections will go on Saturday, Esther. Uh, but Peter, as you know, the, the candidates can promise everything. We, we know how it goes when it comes to politics. You can promise uh, heaven on earth. But uh, the question is into the real works. What is their past history? What have they been able to do? And what do the voters really want to see in Nigeria? With, with the voters that I have spoken with are uh, looking at the track records of all the presidential candidates. Those who have been vice president, they are looking uh, you know, for the vice president, looking at his track record when he was a former uh, vice president, those who are governors, they're looking at them, what did they achieve while they were governors? Peter Obi, they, they talked about his stay, uh, his stint as governor of Anambra State. Then they talk about uh, Asiwa Jubola, Ahmed Tulubu, the presidential candidate of the ruling party. He said he transformed Lagos uh, because Lagos was uh, uh, not so good. Uh, he automated the payment system, sharply reduced corruption. And then you go to Afiku Abubakar, who is the former president. Now, interestingly, the latest polls that are here, one shows Afiku Abubakar winning, the other shows uh, Asiwa Jibola Ahmed of APC winning, and then another shows Peter Obi winning. So you have a three hot race. Different polls are saying these three candidates will win at each other. So some Saturday will determine right. who comes up top. All right, Peter, we'll connect tomorrow. Hope to see you via Skype. Thank you so much, Peter, for your analysis. You're welcome. Thank you. VOS Peter Claude reporting right. for us from Abuja, Nigeria. Now the 36th ordinary session of the African Union Assembly concluded in Addis Ababa Sunday. VOS Paul Ndiho has more on that conference. Comorian President Azari Asumawani is the new chairman of the African Union. He replaces outgoing Senegalese President Macky Sall. In his acceptance speech, Asmawani emphasized the need to exert concerted efforts towards the betterment of Africa and its people. Leaders of the bloc met in Addis Ababa to discuss the many challenges facing the continent, including coups, conflict and climate change. The AU is maintaining its suspension of four countries, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali, and Sudan, that military leaders have ruled following coups. The Africa Union says it has zero tolerance for undemocratic change of power. 
Il ne faut pas que des sanctions... General sanctions should not be allowed to affect countries. We know perfectly well that economic and financial sanctions mainly affect the population, whereas those responsible often have the means to live better. Therefore, we should insist on targeted individual sanctions that can dissuade those who generally carry out coups and avoid general sanctions that could affect the people's interests. The bloc's new chairperson says the leaders have agreed to accelerate the implementation of a flattering trade deal launched in 2020. The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is veiled as the biggest in the world on a continent with 1.4 billion people where Eritrea as the only holdout. Speaking at a press conference on the sidelines of the summit, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres announced that the Central Emergency Response Fund is set at release $250 million to drought-stricken Horn of Africa. Around the world today, 339 million people are in need of humanitarian aid, an increase of more than 25% since last year. And so today, here in Addis, I'm announcing the largest ever allocation from our United Nations Central Emergency Response Fund, $250 million, to combat famine and to address unfunded emergencies. Just before the summit ended, AU leaders resolved to strengthen the capacity of the East African Regional Force stationed in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Washington. And thank you for watching Africa 54. We'll see you tomorrow.